Hello, hello friends. I'm Amanda with AB Adventures and today we are diving into something a little different for Halloween at the Disney parks. The somewhat obvious route is to discuss the Haunted Mansion since it is the most central place for ghosts and ghoulies and we wanted to take a different direction. So this year we are covering the contributions made by an animator and one of the first Imagineers, Ken Anderson. His main contributions to the park centered around the Haunted Mansion and the Fantasyland Dark Rides, which were soon known to have a slight fear factor to them. And with all of these achievements under his belt, he is still highly underappreciated in my opinion. So let's dig into the stories to tell you the truth of Ken Anderson and the spooky rides he originated with the opening of Disneyland. Welcome back guys. As we get started here, be sure to hit that subscribe button to see more videos on Disney history just like this. Now, if you are somewhat new to Disney history, you may not even know who Ken Anderson is. So let's rewind just a tad and give you that backstory. Perhaps you've heard of the nine old men of Disney animation. Well, Ken Anderson was essentially the 10th old man in that group. The term was coined very quickly and offhandedly and kind of left out the ski animator. He had a classic background in architecture and also grew up with an innate love of drawing and art and here's how he tells his story of getting his job at Disney and there was a big sign said Mickey Mouse and Subway Symphonies and Polly said why don't you go in there and get a job and I said well I can't cartoon I'm an architect and sketch artist I don't know anything about cartooning he said well go on in there and get a job I said we need a job yeah we need a job he got the job, and over time he progressed as a leader in animation and story directing, working on Silly Symphonies and eventually Ferdinand the Bull, where he introduced bold color to Disney animation, something everyone thought Walt would dislike greatly. But it ended up being a huge step in animation for them, and he went on to have an integral role in the art direction of Snow White, where, by the way, he introduced the gag of Dopey wiggling his ears based on Ken's own ability to wiggle his ears. He also worked on Fantasia and Cinderella, art directing the larger backgrounds and moods to fit the film. And later, he integrated the use of the Xerox process, which defined the style of an era of Disney films, starting with 101 Dalmatians and continuing through Sword and Stone, Robin Hood, and more. Walt Disney eventually called Ken his jack of all trades, since he had such a talent in so many areas of their business. He was known for having a really serious take on his own work and often thought many of the scenes he worked on should be darker. He often used the terms believable, gutsy, and not namby-pamby, as he called it, <laughs> to describe what he desired in his stories and his characters. On the other hand, though, he wasn't afraid to have a laugh and have some fun. Ken Anderson was also one of the first people whom Walt Disney pulled from the studio and paid personally to start development on the Mickey Mouse Park, which would soon become Disneyland in Anaheim. And he stayed fully immersed in the projects until Walt had him pulled back so that he could work on Sleeping Beauty that was also in production at the studio. Ken was initially assigned work on a haunted house attraction as well as rides set for Fantasyland, particularly Peter Pan's Flight, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, and Snow White and Her Adventures. Constructing Disneyland in those days didn't have people in offices, but rather in warehouses at the actual location of the ride to design, construct, and paint the sets. And each of these creations were vastly a result of teamwork and collaboration, though Ken Anderson did do quite a bit on each of these three. Now, as we get into looking at each of these rides, I do want to mention that the concept of Disneyland was largely new for the time. Typically, amusement parks were expected to be a little bit dirty. The dark rides were known to be cramped and often really frightening. Of course, there are a few rare exceptions to the dirty amusement park collective understanding and Disney took note of those parks. By the time Ken and Claude Coates got put on these projects, the project was already falling behind and Walt said to the two of them, you're going to do it. And the guidance that they got from Disney was to create three rides based on three different characteristics drama, humor, and wonder. And Peter Pan took the wonder category, which is partially why we won't be touching on that here. And Snow White and her adventures got the drama and Mr. Toad the humor. 
jumping right into this, we are first taking a look at Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, the humorous one. And for the most part, it was just that. Claude Coates had begun on this one and finished much of the foundation of the ride. When Ken got involved, he worked on fleshing it out and adding more visualization to bring guests into the story more. And they had to rework the entire layout of the track since the sketches and dimensions they had did not fit what was actually built at the park site. Together, they worked on painting the scenes, the beautiful murals in the loading area, and making sure everything was blacklit appropriately. Now, this attraction truly is a fun jaunt through the film, and it's stories as it fit Walt's request for a humorous dark ride. Yes, Mr. Toad was not the most upstanding citizen, and he does have a chase to get away from the law, but many people enjoyed this ride and found it quite entertaining. That is until the end. After careening through the scenes of the story, avoiding the law, and going to court, Mr. Toad, who is technically you in this ride, gets sent to the ultimate judgment in hell. Yep. There's a whole scene right in hell with the judge depicted as the devil and several surrounding demons. Interestingly enough, Ken had plans for the ride to take guests through hell, but then have them have a form of redemption by ending the ride in heaven. Apparently, though, many people didn't like that Disney was trying to depict heaven in a ride, but they didn't seem to have a problem with hell being depicted. So Ken threw out the heaven idea and just had the guests exit the fiery scene into fantasy land. By the way, I don't know about you, but I really think the little demons look a whole lot like Figment from the Journey into Imagination ride in Epcot, but I digress. Moving on. The next spot we've got to cover is Snow White and what we know as her scary adventures. As I said before, Ken had previously worked on the 1937 animated film, so he intimately knew the story. Notice that the Snow White ride was called Snow White and Her Adventures, leaving out the familiar scary description. When the ride was initially designed, much of it was actually set around the Wicked Witch. Really, it became the Evil Queen's ride, and this was because many of the dark rides were designed to put riders in the story as the main character. And in the film, Snow White has quite a few terrifying encounters. So this ride really multiplied those in many cases, but it really focused on the witch and her schemes, which really a lot of people were not prepared for. Now let's take a look at the original concept for the ride just to get an idea for what they wanted. This particular ride layout was actually made before the park opened as a publicity thing that they could put out for people. And if you see up here at the top, the entrance, you come in and you immediately encounter the witch there and then you see her again above a cauldron you go through the spooky forest but then after that you kind of have this fun little encounter with the dwarves you get to go under them as they're walking across a fallen tree you go by the cottage and then there you see actually Snow White and the witch there together so that was a plan and then you went through the dwarves mine and then had a few more really quick encounters with the witch again ending everything with the witch dropping a boulder on top of you and then there's the happy ending with Snow White and her prince and the dwarves and then you leave and that was the concept way before it actually got done. We know that Walt famously stated he didn't want the main characters within the attractions rather he wanted to be putting the guests in the perspective of the main character which in this case is often a pretty scary position to be. As a result though the idea of having Snow White in the ride was immediately scrapped. Instead the designers changed much of the ride to have a big portion devoted to the witch along with a very large section within a dungeon in the castle. To many of the guests this was a really irrelevant part of the movie and seemed incredibly disjointed in the ride. However what many don't know is back when the 1930s film was being storyboarded, the prince had quite a large role in the film. The story had the evil queen kidnapping him after he refused her marriage proposal and taking him to her dungeon where there was an entire scene with him and an introduction of some skeletons, namely one Oswald. <laughs> and the entire scene was obviously scrapped, but the Imagineers brought back the essence of that to this Disneyland ride. And this explains the extended version of the dungeon in comparison to what was shown in the film. 
Now, we've already said that Disney wanted this ride to be a little more on the scary side. Both Ken Anderson and Claude Coates contributed to this fear factor. Ken drew up initial concepts for the mural that would span across the wall in the loading area. The central point of this mural had a whimsical and cheery mood to it, but flanking either side, you got to the sense of what else would be lurking in the short, dark attraction. And you can see some of those ideas that Ken pulled from deleted sketches that had originally been created for the film. Ken also created some concept art that would be used as publicity for the ride in the Mickey Mouse Club magazine. And you can see the desired plans here, as well as the blatant focus on scariness <laughs> direct from his designs. As you can tell, the art for this attraction has vastly shifted from the light scenes to pretty much all dark and a bit creepy. And while Claude's influence is really seen in the cottage rooms, Ken, without a doubt, had a hand in creating these storylines. Again, they were really pulling on any scariness from the film and as we've observed from the film's abandoned original stories to integrate into this ride. By the time of the opening for the ride, a new layout had been made, and this pulled out some of the calm scenes with the dwarves walking across the fallen tree and the quaint cabin, and replaced them with more bleak scenes with the witch and a longer time spent in the forest. And Ken and Claude painted many of the black light colors onto the cutouts and scenes, particularly the spooky trees in the forest scene. Ken had also made a varying color palette for the different scenes, and in some of them, the painters abandoned them and chose different colors instead. So <laughs> we'll never see that aspect of it, but overall, the essence of the ride became truly dark and creepy, often causing complaints among guests who didn't know Snow White wouldn't be featured in the ride and that it would be so terrifying. Eventually, Disney changed the name to Snow White's Scary Adventures and displayed repeated hints to the attraction's scary nature. There's no denying that this ride was a quintessential fantasy land one, but there is also no denying that even as the Imagineers were attempting to put their guests in the tale of their popular film, they definitely took a more haunting route in the process. So that covers our look at some of the spookier contributions that Ken Anderson made to the dark rides in Fantasyland. I want to reiterate that these dark rides had ties to what many people understood as a dark ride at the time, before Disneyland ever opened. So the Imagineers didn't necessarily want to push horror on guests, but rather went off what they knew and created something completely new and immersive into their own stories. It most certainly set Disney apart from anything guests had experienced even if it was a bit terrifying here and there okay okay some of you may be wondering about this elephant in the room on how i could possibly miss talking about anderson's biggest contribution to the haunted mansion and to that i just have to say with that we'll see you on the flip-flop